This podcast is brought to you by SciFi, the world leader in psychology fitness training. SciFi is scientifically proven to help you optimize your physical, mental, and emotional performance through functional training of your brain, body, and breath. For the first time, have your own clinical psychologist, personal trainer, life coach, breathwork teacher, and mediation instructor all in one. Instead of having to wait months or even years for results, you get them in 75 minutes or less. That's the sci-fi difference. Rewire your brain, retrain your body, and refocus your breath. Learn more at psyfi.nyc. It's been said, you, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit to keep moving forward. That's what Life's Tough, Boxers Are Tougher is all about. I'm your host, Matthew Pomara, and we explore a mountainous challenge that someone in the boxing industry has had to face. In the guest corner, he comes to us from West Palm Beach, Florida, by way of Orange, New Jersey. His record, an outstanding one. 44 wins against only eight defeats, 28 big wins by knockout. Please welcome to the podcast, the former IBF light heavyweight champion, the former WBA cruiserweight champion, the former WBU super cruiserweight champion, Bobby Chappy Chez. What's going on, gentlemen? What's happening? What's happening? What's up, Bobby? Great to have you, pal. My pleasure to be here. I was also going to, I was going to throw in your intro, uh, uh, one of the greatest broadcasters of all time and also a member of Mensa. Uh, this is well, you'll see, be the, the, the only Mensa, Mensa thing, person I've ever had. The Mensa thing kind of throws people off a little bit. It's it's almost like an oxymoron. Uh, I when I turned pro, I had four partial pre med scholarships to be an orthopedic surgeon offered to me, and a senatorial appointment to West Point, a free ride for four years, four years, and I chose to fight instead. And everybody said he's not that smart. And he, he can't be that smart. <laughs> and, and here, but here's the thing. And there's a there's a backstory to everything. There really is. For me, I'm not religious. I don't believe in God, so I don't believe in heaven and hell. And yet I want to still carry on. I want to be remembered. So for me to do that, I had to, in some way, shape, or form, put myself in history. I'm now in sports history three times. There's no other champion there for those three separate times but me. So I live forever in the history books. Yeah, and you're, and you're, in, the, uh, you're in the Polish American and the Italian American Hall of Fame. So you got that going for you, too. I have yeah three other Hall of Fames too. I mean, and that, that's oh really yeah, nice. AC too, right? I, I, AC, I wish I would have gone AC, to that. Rochester, New York Boxing Hall of Fame, AC, and uh, there was another one somewhere down the road. Ah, uh, so tell us what you're doing these days, buddy. Well, I'm gonna start broadcasting again. You're not gonna believe this, but they have have brought bare knuckle boxing back to being legal. And when I, I first got when when I first <laughs> when I first got called in, on this, I went. I just, I thought it was a joke. I, was, I thought there was a joke in it somewhere because somebody's, you know, people like to play with me and mess with me because I'm A, a boxer and also in Mensa. So they like to take a shot at me. And I said, are you serious? And they said, they sent me some tapes. And uh, yeah, it's legal again, bare knuckle boxing. It's, it's, and you know what? It's been, it's, the, the turnout so far, I've been pretty good. Well, you're down in Florida. I think pretty much everything is legal down in Florida. So that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, hey, they're lucky to have you. You're, uh, you know, you, you're a great fighter, no question about that. But uh, I have to tell you, I, I think as far as uh, boxer versus a broadcaster, uh, I think you're I think you're one of the best broadcasters of all time. So uh, it's going to be great to have you back behind the mic and uh, long overdue. You know, when Don Dumphy, the voice of boxing for 50 years, was inducted into, into the Box, International Boxing Hall of Fame, and I was one of the people up there helping him, you know, and hurry him in. He said to me, Bobby, he said, I got to tell you this. I was called the voice of boxing for 50 years, maybe the best over the 50 years. He said, I couldn't shine your shoes if I wanted to. He said, you've been everywhere, done it all, and still speak pretty much as well as any of us. <laughs> and you're smarter than most of us, <laughs> which I thought was funny and a great compliment. Absolutely. Don, Duff, Don Dumphy is the Walter Cronkite of boxing. Pretty so, much. Yeah, so that's you, you can't get a higher praise than that. Um, you know, you've you had a spectacular career, uh, you know, four different weight classes. You made your mark in all four of them. Um, Actually, six. Six classes. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so you really, uh, you really made your mark out there and, um, you know, but the name of the show, right, is Life's Tough Boxers are Tougher. Um, I know you've had to overcome some uh, tough challenges. Um, so tell us why you're tougher than life. Well, you know, it's very funny you should ask that question because I was in the uh, New York Boxing uh, Hall of Fame, uh, Rochester Boxing Hall of Fame. When I was inducted, I was inducted in for uh, a tough guy, uh, one of the toughest fighters in history in my, in my respective sport. And I, when I was writing the speech, the acceptance speech, I had a little, I had a little trouble writing the speech because I honestly didn't know if I came by being tough on my own. As, as I've come to learn over the years, there's two different things. So people say, who's the best fighter you ever fought? I know they say, they say, who's the toughest fighter you ever fought? I said, tough or good. And they said, what do you mean? What's the difference? Tough is your ability to take an ass whooping. Good is your ability to give an ass whooping. Tommy Hearns was as good as he gets offensively, but defensively, he wasn't very tough. When you hit, he got hit really hard, he went down or he went out. So I thought over the years that pretty much I really got kind of beat to do this from the time I was little. My father, like, he was very vicious, a violent disciplinarian. But from the time I was 10, I had to go to the gym. My brothers were nine and seven. We were forced to go to the gym six days a week. Now, at the age of 10, that's kind of a rough rig, you know, that's a rough request. <laughs> and it was funny because I remember September of 72, I was born in uh, 62, so I was 10 years old. I went to the gym and I worked out September, October, November, December, January, February, up till February the 9th, the day before my 11th birthday, to I sparred for the very first time. And I was sparring with a kid that was about 20 pounds, 25 pounds heavier than me. And when you weigh 98 pounds, that's a lot of weight. Yeah. And and I beat him mercilessly. And my father was actually training me. And the trainer in the gym actually got insulted that one of his kids got beat so badly by me on my first day. So he put in a, a junior Olympic fighter who was two years older than me, only about eight pounds more than me in weight, but had two gold medals in the junior Olympics. And I looked at my father's petrified. And my father just looked at me and he when he looked at you with that look, you knew you you had you had to not you had to not be afraid of anything. Otherwise, he'd kill you. And the that next round that I was almost a blur. I mean, I don't almost I don't remember almost any part of it. But when I was done, I got a standing ovation from everybody in the gym. The onlookers, the fighters, the trainers, the managers, everybody gave me a standing ovation. That day, that day, I believed I was special. And I was only, like I said, day before my 11th birthday. And that day I said, I thought to myself, I'm going to be a world champion at this. And it's going to take, and I said, it's going to take me. <laughs> 14 years to do it and at the age of 24 september 6 1986 i won my first world title i fulfilled my own prophecy well that's pretty impressive um i i know you i know your father uh looms very big uh in your history uh are you comfortable talking about that yeah i'm i'm i've settled with it uh back in the day i was not that comfortable with it and i got a little too emotional and upset but i'm good with it now yeah, i can talk Anything you have to say, you I'll answer or I'll tell you that's off limits. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so so to, you know, it, it was a tough. I know it was a tough childhood. I, I you know, I've I've read all kinds of stuff. Uh, talk a little bit about that and and how you know and how you were able to overcome that, or actually, I wouldn't even say overcome it to actually make it work for you. That I was just going to say that's a better phrase. You know what? Um, yeah. Uh, Polish, uh, literally a Polish guy born in Poland, not from here, born in Warsaw, Poland. My grandmother was from Italy and they met here in Orange, New Jersey. And at the time, my grandfather that I've never met because he died when my dad was two, he was wealthy because he, well, I shouldn't say wealthy. He was comfortable as hell. He was a jeweler and during the depression, he made $70 a week. That was a ton of money. Yeah. Now. He was fine, but he didn't believe in life insurance. He didn't believe in preparing for after he was gone. He said, look, you know, he's one of those guys who would say, look, when I'm not here, you fend for yourself. So he was, he was a little bit not too intelligent in, in that area. 
And my grandmother was a, you know, she was a homemaker. My dad and his brother was five years older, my Uncle Tom. She took care of the kids. She took care of the house. She took care of family. She did, she did everything she was supposed to. And now all of a sudden, my grandfather passed away. Uh, he had high blood pressure and he, quit, he refused to quit drinking. So it got to him and eventually caused him to, to pass away. And now my grandmother, who doesn't speak perfect English, who doesn't have a skill, has to do whatever she can to feed her kids, whether it's washing toilets or whatever it is. So somewhere along the way, my father went off and again, his dad, his cousin, his, my uncle, who was his brother was five years older than him. His, he was a little further along. My dad was only two when his dad died. So as he started to grow up and come to school and learn, he didn't learn the right way. And he, he went off on the sort of the bad track, hung out with the bad guys, the bad group, did some bad stuff, spent a couple of years in Jamesburg prison. Oof. And then, uh, yeah, that wasn't good either. That was a, that was a tough learn. <laughs> <laughs> as he got out and he met my mom and once again not uh, necessarily doing things as accurately as he should be she got pregnant at 17 he was still 17 i was born before both of them turned 18 so now you have kids they got married shotgun marriage pretty much you got kids having kids so the chances are not that great that i'm going to have that good a shot at things but my father was determined to make sure that all his children did the right thing because he was never taught to do the right thing and he resented it. But he resented it, resented it in such a violent fashion that the beatings I took as a child, grown men wouldn't take. I mean, it was, it was, it was like that bad. I've, I've, I've often told some people interviews and they said, oh, you're exaggerating. I said, you know what? If anything, I'm understating it because I'm embarrassed. And yet, at the end of the day, I remember when I got married and I was sitting down with my brothers at the table and we were having a Thanksgiving dinner. And I talked to my brothers. Everybody had been, you know, my mom, my wife, her mom and her sister, we were all doing something. My daughter wasn't even born yet. And me and my brothers were just sitting there and we're looking at each other and we go, my one brother says, he said, we're not like other people, are we? I said, no, I don't think we are. I think we're, I think we're very different, but I think I'd rather like being this way because I can handle anything they throw at me. And my baby brother said, yeah. He said, we, we suffered then to live better now. And that was the only way we could basically be okay with it. And we're still okay with it. Yeah. And look, as, as, as hard as that sounds, and it, and it sounds hard, um, you know, I hate to say it, but you're right. You're better for it, right? You're, you've had to overcome a lot in your life. And this is certainly, you know, that's certainly no challenge. Um, and again, if, if you're comfortable talking, going further about your father. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll tell you what, he was a very bright guy, even though he was self-taught, nothing really learned in school and had to get his GED and all that stuff. But here's the thing. He got the lessons of life and he, when he learned them, he held on to them and he, and he cherished them and valued them. He used to tell me, on a regular basis, he said, and he used to point to his head like this, it's all here, it's all here. And what's up here translates into here, your heart. And he said, you have to choose in any situation, you have to choose a path, you have to choose the course. So you do your best if it's quick, if it's something that's gonna be you know, momentarily, you have to, it has to register for your brain immediately. You have to do what you can to, choose the right path, take it. But when you commit to it, commit to it fully. So as time went by, picture this. My father, my father was so vicious. He made Hitler look like Mother Teresa. <laughs> my mother was so nice. She made Mother Teresa look like Hitler. <laughs> so if you have those two extremes in you and every sort of plateau in, be in between to like neutral in the middle, and now it's a matter of, of your brain choosing which place to go. That's who I am. Everything I do is programmed in from my head. Now I've done some crazy stuff too, just because I felt like it. And you know, you, you get a case of the what the hells. So every once in a while I go, ah, what the hell? But you know, it's not always the right thing to do. Well, you know, you had a, an absolutely outstanding career. Um, 
and you and you shined, uh, you know, throughout your career. Um, so as, as tough as that was, you, you're definitely proof uh, that it's tougher, right? You know, you're tougher than life because that a lot of people don't overcome that, and uh, you were able to do it. Uh, talk to us about how it affected your career and ha- and how it helped you, um, you know, succeed. Well, my father. He helped me learn what I can do with my mind. And there are times over the years, there have been times over the years where I was very close to saying, you know what, this just this is just too much. Like there would be days I would come home from training and my dad died obviously when I was 21, I was very young. There'd be times when I'd come home from training, I was 24, 25, 23, whatever. And, I, and my nose would be broke, I'd be bleeding, my jaw would be swollen and I'd be exhausted and fall asleep right in my food. And my mother would say, son, why are you doing this to yourself? You're killing yourself. You're going to kill yourself. And she would cry all the time. And I'd say, mom, I have to do this. I have to be special. She said, you are special. Everyone's special. I said, no, I have to be special to the world. The world has to know my name. And I'm Robert Edward Ches Jr. So I'm named after my father. So in some way, too, it's a tribute to my dad for being my dad that I'm able to give him something posthumously. And I, I just was, I was driven to do it. I was just driven to do it. And no matter what, I, I'm coming come hell or high water. And I'm going to die trying. And lo and behold, I was lucky to be good enough to do it. Uh, talk about your mom and uh, how much, uh, how much support she gave. She, was she, uh, uh, what I will say, the typical Italian mom? Oh, pretty, pretty, pretty much the typical Italian, old school Italian mom. Oh yeah, old school for sure. I mean, we're back back in the '60s when I was born. You know, she was just again, she just turned 18 in '62 when I was born. I was born five days before my father was 18, four months before my mother turned 18. And yeah, that was it was old school, old school, the old school of respect to this, to this, to that, things you do in order. And yeah, the old school Italian. You start with the meal and the whole thing, the family gets together every week and you have dinner together and but my dad was so mean and so brutal to her that he he kind of broke her spirit he kind of he kind of broke everything and he did have on time to time he broke her nose he cracked her jaw Jeez. he did uh, wasn't always the nicest guy in the world and but it was his way and if you stepped in uh you got broke and i remember there were times when uh, he was hit me when i did something wrong he would hit, hit us what he would do is he would make me go to his room and get his belt, the big leather belt. I knew which one it was. It was the one he always beat us with. He'd bring it to him. Then I'd have to turn around. And he would start at my shoulder blades and hit me and swing and maybe seven or eight swings till he hit it down, all the way down to behind my knees. So from my knees to my shoulder blades, if I took off my shirt, I was one big welt. And one day I was in school and I asked the gym teacher, Mr. Shooty, one of my favorite guys, I said, I listen, I said, I can't be skins today playing basketball. He said, why? And I picked up my shirt. He goes, oh, my God, what happened to you? I did something wrong in the house. He goes, oh, put your shirt down, put your shirt down. So it, it kind of became known amongst everybody in the neighborhood that my father was a little bit of a sociopath. And that was, that was, that, that, that's it. He was my dad. And if it was his way, it was my way. And I had to do it. And there was no walking away from that. You didn't walk away from it, ever. Wow, that is that is powerful stuff. And it's definitely tough. Um, really, uh, you know, I mean, again, I, I admired you before the podcast, so I uh, definitely admire you even more now. Um, on, on a lighter, uh, I want to stay on this, This, uh, I want to stay definitely talking about this, but on a lighter part of the this conversation how tough was it making uh 160 pounds when your mom is an italian cook you know what she was a great cook but uh i had i, I when i came out of the amateurs i was fighting at super middle at 168 i'm sure 165 and I, I weighed around 163 leaned out so making that extra three pounds as i got a little older and had to fight more rounds was tough it really became hard it got to the point where i i emaciated myself so much that i was unhealthy so I went up to super middleweight, then eventually I filled out a light heavyweight. And the other you know, cruiserweight, super cruiserweight, heavyweight, I just did that for the money because I want to take a shot at making some big money. But that didn't really happen. 
but even though my mom was as great a cook as she was, she also knew that uh, if she did anything wrong, at, even at the table with regard to food, that my father would have flew off the flew off the handle right right on the spot, and that would have been the end of it. So, but my mom, this is this is kind of weird. For some people, don't get it. My mom set the tone for me with regard to real respect and real love and real hardship because the hardest job on the face of the earth is being a housewife and mother. It is a 24 hour a day job, whether you sleep or not. You have to take care of the kids. You have to take care of the husband. You have to take care of the house. You have to take care of the food. You have to make sure everything's clean. You have to make sure everything is right because he's off working. When he comes home though, the day's over. My mom's day was never over. And she was never treated completely right. She was never treated really right. And I resented that. And my wife, unfortunately, passed away. Uh, and but my wife would tell you that never, I never even raised my voice to her once. I, I knew her for so many years and we were married for so many years. We never even had an argument. Never mind a fist fight or, or anything like that. Jeez. And um, my mother's the reason why, I mean, it's kind of the, one of the reasons why I married Kimberly is because she was more like my mom than any other woman I'd ever met inside. She was beautiful outside, a former model and actress, but, and I'm not, trust me, if she was not that good looking and she was all that nice, I would have still been attracted to her niceness, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're honest. I'm a little bit shallow. I'm a little bit shallow. You're, you're being honest. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> Um, but uh, it was, it was, uh, marrying Kimberly was the uh, best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about, uh, talk a little bit about Kimberly. Uh, you know, uh, I know you, uh, well, I'll let you tell it. So tell us a little bit about Kimberly, about your relationship. You know, in a nutshell, if I could encapsulate who she was, if I wrote down on a piece of paper, in such finite detail, every tiny little thing I wanted in my dream woman, she would have surpassed, I would have gotten less, that paperwork would have been less than who she was to me. She was, she was the epitome of life. The nicest, most incredible person I've ever known. I literally, I asked the doctor when we were in there, she had a female woman, female doctor that was taking care of her cancer. And I said, listen, doc, is there any way you can draw the cancer out of her and just shove it in me and let me die and let her live? She said, I wish it worked that easy. I wish it were that simple. It's not. I was just, uh, it was the worst day of my life. I, I never, ever, ever want to go through that again. But Well, that's you life. know, you, you've overcome so much and, and, uh, and I mean, those are, those are two, I don't think a lot of people come back from, from either of those things. And the fact that you, uh, you know, turned a very, very tough childhood into a very uh, strong career. The fact that you, um, you know, the way you talk about your dad, I, you could tell the frustration, but you could also tell the, um, you know, I don't I wanted, say, make, I, would say, I, wanted, I wanted to make him proud. I loved him too, so much. Yeah. You could see that in, in the way you talk about it. And I think, uh, I think there's a lot to be uh, admired here um and again on the kimberly uh front you know again a lot of people don't come back from that either uh so the fact that you've uh been able to bounce back from that and it's not that you've ever fully recovered of course but the fact that you're able to bounce back and still function uh i think that, that says a lot about your character as well well you know what uh i'm, I'm going to contradict one little tiny piece of what you said sure i have come back from both of those things 100 percent, and I was just literally thinking about that the other day because before I go to sleep at night, every night, I think about the things I did that day that I might have done a little better and some things that I might have done a little worse and do some things to improve myself for the next day so I'm a little bit of a better person. But I've gotten over my dad. I've gotten over my wife. And, and, and in, a, in a weird way, I'll never get over either. But yeah. I, don't let it, I don't let it affect my current life anymore. I don't let it affect my modern decisions. And that's important to me. Why do, you, why do you think that is? My dad taught me, he said, what you do with your brain, he said, your brain runs your body. Even some of the stuff, like when you swallow, 
you don't have to think to swallow. You just swallow. The peristalsis takes place on its own. So it's like a, you know, it's a, it's a natural thing that happens, a natural process. But with your brain, it's the same thing. You don't have to think to breathe. You breathe. But when it comes to something conscious, you have to think. And then you have to make a decision. And you have to make a decision based on what information you have. And then you have to live with that decision forever. So I try to not make any more bad decisions and yet I can live, but I still, I still live with the memories and I can't, you can't get necessarily over them. Like there are days when I'm sitting in front of the TV watching something that reminds me of my wife or my father. And I just, I just well up my eyes, just water up, there's no, no stopping it. But at the same time, I can handle it. I, I can handle anything. And as long as I believe that, as long as I believe that, throw it at me. <laughs> Well, you certainly have done, uh, you certainly have proven that you can. And uh, again, decorated career, great broadcaster, excited that you're going to get back behind the mic. Um, let's, uh, so, and again, it, you're, you're an inspiration to our uh, listeners, which we're, we're grateful for. That's where, what we really want to get across in the show. It's, you know, I believe me, I'd love to keep you on and talk boxing for, uh, for five hours, but, uh, I, we really want to inspire here. And I think you're a great inspiration and I can't thank you enough. Oh, I appreciate that very much. Well, so now we're come to a part of the show, uh, and we call this the fast five, right? Okay. So we're going to ask you five questions, uh, you're sharing, um, and uh, we're interested to hear uh, your thoughts on it. So what's your favorite box? My favorite box movie, I guess, because of the actual authenticity of it would probably have to be Raging Bull. Nice. The, authentic the authenticity of it was, is, you know, it's real. I mean, they, they, you know, really did a hell of a job with it. I imagine you met Jake to, uh, a couple times oh, I met, your wife. I met Jake's, you know what? Let me tell you a funny story about Jake LaMotta. I met Jake LaMotta several times, maybe five times over the course of my life. And one time I was in... Uh, Canastota at the, the casino, Indian casino up there. And we were, there was a lot of uh, fight people up there. And his son, Jake Jr. was there. And he introduces me to Jake Jr. He said, Bobby Chess, I wanted to meet my son, Jake Jr. He said, Jake, this is Bobby Chess. He slept with your mother. <laughs> and he didn't use that word. He used the other word. But yeah, <laughs> I said, Jake, I didn't sleep with his mother. Stop saying it. He said, he's always, oh, it's okay. She sleeps with all the boxers all the time. So Tony Danza happened to be, Tony Danza happened to be in the place that up there too. And I said, do you believe he did that to me? He goes, yeah, she was great. <laughs> I, was like, oh. I, I didn't oh know what God. to say. I just didn't know what to that, say. That might, make, that might make the highlight reel. That might have to make the highlight reel. Uh, it works for me. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Uh, and for the record, you're saying that didn't happen. So uh, we're going to take no, you. No, it, didn't, it didn't happen. I would have, um, I would have, I would have owned up to it. It was beautiful. Right, tell us, I would have owned up to it. <laughs> was that, that was Vicky? Yep. Vicky. Oh yeah. She was beautiful. Um, all right. Polish food she, versus she, Italian. By food. the way, by the way, she did invite me back to her place, but I was there with my friend, who, oh, dear friend, who's a lawyer who was 72 and couldn't, and doesn't, didn't drive, didn't have a license. I wouldn't let him get out of New York city on his own. I wouldn't let him. Otherwise, I would have went. I would. I would have taken the invitation up. But that was back in the day. All right, tell us what you like better: Polish food or Italian food? Italian food takes that. That wins that race. I'm like hands down. But you know what? In Italy, Italian food is a lot more bland than it is here. If you yeah. go to Italy, it's it's not quite the same. But the Polish food is a little too, a uh, little too soft for me. I don't. I don't really enjoy it that much. But no, Italian food absolutely wins that race. What's uh? What's your favorite sport other than boxing? Oh, that's easy. Football. I wanted to be a football player since I was five years old. I wanted what to be a team? running back. Uh, I wanted to play for the Green Bay Packers. All right. <laughs> yeah, my favorite team. Oh wow, the Packers. Nice. Well, yeah. When you grew up too, that would have made uh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I I could see you playing for Lombardi, no problem. So I, I think you would have been a great Green Bay Packer. Uh, I have a couple of good friends that are uh, Packer diehards. Um, is there anybody past or present that you wish you could share the ring with? Yeah, I wanted to fight Tommy Hearns. For years and years and years, they talked about it, and Tommy this, Tommy that. And I knew Manuel Stewart from when I was 15. The first loss I ever had in the amateurs was to a fighter that he trained. 
and he knew what I could. Yeah, he had a cronk. Exactly. He knew what I 15, what I could do and how tough I was. And we joked about it years later after both Tommy and I were retired. And he said, you know, I told Tommy, he said, I told Tommy Hearns, you should probably stay away from Bobby Chess. Because <laughs> he's going to beat you all day, no matter what you hit him with. And he's going to eventually catch you. So you, it's going to be a tough fight. But I, I would have liked to fight him because that would have been my million dollar fight. I would have crossed that seven figure line. Plus, it would give me a better place in history. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get you. You know, I ran, uh, I ran Barkley's, uh, a buddy of mine and he, uh, good friend of mine too. Yeah. The blade. And, uh, you know, he, he has, he notched two big wins over, over him. So, um, you know, he's, he's had a lot of free steak dinners on those two wins. I could tell you that my friend. I guarantee he's had a few, had a few drinks from me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we come to the tricky part of the uh, of the podcast, and this is usually the fifth question. Um, and it's uh, tell us a clean joke or a semi not that dirty joke. How about that? All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm I don't know too many jokes that aren't that dirty, so I'm gonna <laughs> flip I'm gonna flip and give you a little something different. Uh, okay, a little bit of a rid- a little bit of a riddle. We love it. Okay, what's greater than God? More evil than the devil? The poor have it, but the rich, excuse me, the poor have it, but the rich need it. Okay. The rich need it. I don't know, bud. You're going to have to tell us. Okay. Well, when the guy who said it to me, he said it to me, and I went through it. I went, I went through it all at once like that, and I went, now you got to break this down. What does, uh, what's greater than God? Nothing. Nothing. What, nothing. What's more evil than the devil? Nothing. What did a rich need? Nothing. What did a poor have? Nothing. So I said nothing. He said, you're the only one that's ever got, he said, you're the only one that's ever got the damn riddle. I said, yeah, well, I broke it down. And then sometimes you have to break it down and not answer, not answer the, 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 the answer. It can't be, in, you know, a total answer. It has to be a piece by piece answer. But that turns out to be the total answer as well. That's a hell of a, that's a hell of a good riddle, my friend. It's interesting. I think you'll, you'll remember it now forever. <laughs> I will absolutely remember that forever. All right, let's do a, let's do a bonus question, and uh, you sure. you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but uh, I would definitely I'm dying to hear the answer to this. Um, so it, it's widely known that you would bet on yourself in your fights. Oh yeah, matter of fact, when I fought Slaboni Kachar, and I and, and for my first world title, I, I bet twenty five thousand in cash into the casino on myself. And I won. Was that the biggest bet you ever did? Uh, on no, yourself. I bet, I bet 50 on myself once before. I, I bet I won. Nice. Yeah, I mean, nice. Diamond Jim McDonald, his manager was so sure he was going to win that he bet Lou, he bet my he bet my my uh, promoter Carlo D. They bet they bet twenty five thousand on that too, and I told Carlo, Carlo I said put in another twenty five, make it fifty. And so I went I went partners with him on that one. <laughs> And you demolished him, by the way. That was a that was a demo job. It was fun. So, it was yeah. fun. I, I enjoyed I, and I was talking to him the whole time. I enjoyed torturing the man. Yeah, that was uh well, anybody uh anybody hasn't seen that, you can catch that fight on YouTube. I, I actually watched it when we were prepping he, for this. He came into Atlantic City and with all his crew, and they all and they all had on shirts that said Bobby Who, champion of what? And I was like got to be disrespectful you got to be you know a real ass to do something like that so while i was while i was beating him up i would talk to him and i would how do you like that and i would hit him and i would, and I would tell him what i was going to hit him with and hit him with it anyway but you know he he just was disrespectful as hell i didn't like the guy uh, i didn't mind i didn't <laughs> mind torturing him i really didn't um and I also, uh, I'm going to do one more. We've never done two bonus questions, but I got to do one more extra bonus question. Uh, who hit yeah, harder? Go we'll for three. <laughs> <laughs> who hit harder? Ray Mercer, Corey Sanders, or uh, I know you, you sparred with Mercer. I know you fought Sanders and you fought Holyfield at the Garden. Who hit harder of those three guys? Ray Mercer hit me harder than I've ever been hit in my entire life. He hit me once with a right hand. We were in the gym, and the gym was a big, big warehouse, and, and I thought that a piece of cement fell out of the ceiling and hit me. I, th- I thought a block of cement fell out of the ceiling. But he, you asked Ray himself. He hit me with it, and I was like, I was out. I mean, I couldn't see him. He was right in front of me. He weighed 235 pounds. I only weighed about 192 at the time. 
And I fired back four shots hitting him. And he said, I'll be damned. That's the best right hand I ever threw in my life. I said, well, I am tough. <laughs> Corey, well, Sanders was just, Corey Sanders was just too fast for me at the time at 240, 245. It, him coming as fast as he would, carrying as much weight as he did. And I, at 30, at 36, I just didn't have the, the reflexes anymore. Just didn't have it. Hey, hey man, he, he demolished Vladimir Klitschko. So I don't think, uh, I don't think there's any any uh, there's no loss or respect for losing to him. He absolutely demolished Klitschko Sanders. So um, I misjudged his speed. It's, I didn't re- I did not realize how just how quick he was, and I couldn't get out of the way. As a matter of fact, if you watch at the end of the first round, he hit me so many times. I'm like I couldn't get out of the way, but I just took a knee. I, I he didn't knock me. He didn't hurt me. I just took the knee because I need to get out of the way of all the shots that were hitting me. It was annoying. But uh, I could still think I could still think clearly by being hit with all the shots, which scared me a little too. <laughs> well, you know, Bobby, we call it like I said, we call the show "Life's Tough, Boxers Are Tougher." Uh, I, I don't think there's any question what you described today uh, that you're tougher than life. We're excited to see the next chapter. I know you're going to write a new chapter, and uh, we're grateful for you here. Um, can we find you on social media? What uh, in how can we find? How do we find you? How do fans find you? Know, you? You know what, Matt? I'm not on social media. I don't like it only because somehow it just seems to follow you wherever you go. And, and then the people get incessant and they start to get personal. And I just don't enjoy it. If you will go Bobby at bobbychez.com, just remember how to spell my last name, C-Z-Y-Z. I'll answer any questions you have one-on-one. I'll write to you. I'll write to you. I'll answer you back. I've had, I've had literally thousands. I've had since I retired, 1998, I retired. This is 2022. I still have people from Europe finding my just this writing emails to me, and then I have to send them pictures or they want to send me stuff. Or it's it's just insane. But I'm really appreciative that I'm still remembered so well. Well, listen to the career you put together. There's no surprise to me, um, ladies and gentlemen. He's the he's a three time champion, uh, heck of a nice guy, and uh, real obviously one of the smartest guys we've ever had on the, uh, I can, I can, I can say this unequivocally. Um, you know, we, we hope the podcast gets renewed. We've got a couple more episodes left of the first season. I can say unequivocally, even if we get renewed for 10 straight years, I don't think we're going to get another Benson member on. So uh, I, you know I think- what, you'd be, you'd be surprised. There, there's a number of people in, in this, in the Mensa community. Uh, Suzanne box. Summers, that, Suman Summers, the back, boxing there was only one other person I know to be a Mensa, Henry Milligan, former cruiserweight from Jersey and Princeton, but he doesn't speak very well these days because, and this is something not, not due to anything from of his abilities or inabilities. Again, tough. Something, I can't teach you to be tough. I can teach you to be good, but can't teach you to be tough. Tough is something you either are or aren't based on your genetics. And sometimes I think people that... Uh, just they, they, no matter what they do, they're going to get punchy if they're fighting. And you can't, you know, you can't teach tough. You can't teach it. You just can't do it. Well, I don't think I could sum it up better than that. I want to thank you again, Bobby Chez. Thanks for being on the program. And uh, we'll, we'll see you around. Can't wait to catch pleasure. up with you again. You got an open invitation. Give me any time you like, man. Thanks, buddy. See you soon. That's going to be the final bell for today's podcast. If you like what you hear, give us a like and hit the subscribe button with your best power punch. You can check us out at Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you can find quality podcasts. We hope our stories inspire you to fight on. We thank you for listening. And remember, life's tough. Boxes are tougher. Have a great week, everyone.